This is Toby Capwell, historian, author, and expert on medieval and Renaissance arms and armor. Today, he's joining us to share his reactions to the Warriors of Warhammer Fantasy and 40K using some of Warhammer's games, images, and animations. People often think of knights being the antithesis and the opposite to gunpowder weapons and the people who use them. They're saying here, what if knights existed in a technological future? Yeah, they'd love automatic weapons. Be sure to check out our previous episode with Toby, as well as our other experts such as ex-SAS Billy Billingham, and let us know in the comments what games, universes, arms and armor you'd like to see on the show. Right, over to Toby. Knights on flying horses. That's a new one. It's hard enough to command regular heavy cavalry. Uh, I mean, a guy in armor has no idea what's going on. He can't see very much. He can't hear anything. He can't even imagine what kind of a mess it would be to have knights flying around on, on winged horses. <laughs> and here, they're actually varying it a bit more. So the individual knights have got their own colors, their own heraldic devices. The equipment is, is different. Some of them got their helmets on, some don't. I, that's, looking, that's looking good, actually. Use of two-handed weapons on horseback, it's usually not a thing. You need your left hand to control the horse. They're mixing references from different historical periods, but maybe in the, in the context of this fantasy environment, they're not worried about that. This is looking like the 13th, 14th century, this infantry, more or less. By that point, we do know that there was use of identifying colors and like livery badges identifying foot soldiers as belonging to a certain knight or whatever. I'm not sure what that's supposed to be. It's like a corpse, some kind of weird mascot. Why are they on the ground? Shouldn't they be like dropping bombs or something? Isn't that what air power is for? <laughs> I mean, obviously it's another very you know, deeply fantastical situation. But they, they captured something of what kind of individual knightly visual impact is like. But in the overall kind of visual character, you know, I think that was, you know, that was interesting to look at. So these guys immediately have kind of a slightly more Renaissance flavor to them like all the scrolls and inscriptions on the, the griffin's armor there. That has a, a very kind of German Renaissance, early 16th century kind of feel about it. And again, it's, it's nice to get those references even in a, in, a, in a fantasy game. And there you go, there's some more Renaissance troops right there. Lightly armored handgunners. Yeah, I mean, there, in the early 16th century, when they're, you know, where they're drawing their inspiration from this, there was a kind of mini heavy cavalry revolution where you know there was a renewed interest and in use of of heavily armored you know cavalry and so you know that kind of works with this in a in a weird way oh this is cool these are like light cavalry they're, they're wearing armor again very renaissance this is like second quarter of the 16th century they've got handheld firearms they're more lightly armored their horses have no armor so they can move faster that's that's all totally real and legitimate that's that's nice looking lance connects all that very flamboyant puffed and slashed clothing now here divesting yourself of helmets and the guys just wearing big hats that's a real thing the lance connects were famous for for that although plenty of them did wear helmets too. The Lanzknechts were like German and Swiss mercenary companies in the early 16th century. I mean, for, for fantasy, this has a very strong, very specific historical through line, which is really, really nice to see alongside the griffins and whatever. I guess those are female griffins then? Griffins without wings? Well, in the older, you know, medieval mythology, female griffins don't have wings. It's a bizarre mashup now, isn't it? With these uh, Hulk-like orcs and goblins and stuff. I mean, it, cause they obviously don't have any sort of strong historical basis to them. They're not making those sorts of references. So it, from a design point of view, it actually really accentuates the, the serious contrast between one type of force and another. I like that a lot, actually. I like that more than I thought I did actually. 
<laughs> or I thought I would. Again, it's fantasy, but with a lot of complex reference to human reality. That's what makes it good. I actually really like it when you see these guys with their helmets off. There's this really interesting dichotomy in the character between, you know, the identifiable human and what the armor transforms them into. The Codex Astartes does not support this action. Try to keep up. You know, because the armored body is becoming something more than human. That's what, like, medieval knightly culture is totally based on. You know, knights, historically, were the aristocracy, and the aristocracy claimed the rights to rule on earth directly from God. God had chosen them as a special people to wield special divine powers that weren't available to the rest of humanity. These are not ordinary human beings. They're special, they're powerful, they are superhuman in a very literal, material, tangible way. And I, and I think the design of uh, the Space Marines and Warhammer is really keying into that as well. They're showing you the human inside versus their armored identity. Um, and that really comes across when you see them without their helmets and the contrast uh, between the the effect of a space marine when he's got the helmet on versus when you can see his face it becomes an identifiable human again it's uh it works really well my lord you have saved us rise guardsmen you saved yourselves and the relationship with the common soldiers is really it's a nice contrast as well I mean, generally throughout Warhammer and throughout all the Space Marine armor, they always tend to have these solid one-piece shoulder plates where the entire shoulder, almost to the, to the elbow, is covered by one single big plate. Again, if you look at real, real armor, mobility in here is really critical. Now, if you don't have that that those plates that can collapse and move with this action, you can't move. Now, maybe with their heavy weapons, the Space Marines, they don't need to move their arms upwards very much, but even in those suits, I think that would have been a problem that where they're relying on the digital artist to magically give them more mobility than they probably would actually have. But, you know, again, this is starting to get beyond the realm of a, of a medieval, art historian to comment. I guess he seems to be coping. Worry not, Captain. I've saved some orcs for you. And you know, the use of weapons like that is very consistent too. You know, people often think of, of historically of knights being the antithesis and the diametric opposite to gunpowder weapons and the people who use them. But actually, a lot of, an, or of the earliest handheld gunpowder weapon technology was developed first for knights to use on horseback in armor. And contrary to a lot of popular misconception, the knights were the first people to, to use the, that new technology. So, you know, they're saying here, what if knights existed in a technological future? Yeah, they'd love automatic weapons. Okay, a chainsaw sword. Whatever works, I guess. Well, I mean, if you're, if you're fighting orcs like this who may have really thick skin and really dense muscle, you might, you might need something special to get through that. And there, there's an interesting hypothesis that uh, gladiators in ancient Rome often allowed themselves to gain weight and even became kind of overweight so that the, extra, the, the fat and the, the skin and everything would allow them to be cut, lacerated in theatrical gladiatorial combat without suffering a serious internal injury. So, you know, the actual makeup of the body, the thickness of the skin, the amount of fat and muscle on there is, uh, is another consideration here, perhaps. And I mean, the Romans never had chainsaw swords, but I, I bet they would have liked them. <laughs> Uh, 
And now the knights are coming to save their poor common soldiers. But showing it from the common soldier's perspective gives it a, a really amazing kind of emotional impact. You know, it, it shows they've thought about that. And there's a great contrast between his gear and his physical size and what the common soldier has to work with. Sometimes, you know, when I talk about armor as a kind of a visual expressive art form, people seem a bit quizzical because we're so used to thinking of armor in practical terms as equipment for fighting. The modern mind often has a problem with the idea that something can be a utilitarian object and a, an expressive work of art at the same time. But the, you know, the proof is found in the effectiveness of images like this, where these guys have loads of stuff on their gear that's got nothing to do with function. It doesn't, you know, putting the big winged skulls on their breastplates and the everything and the gold decoration, that doesn't make them any safer. It, but it's all about the visual impact of, of that. And here we're seeing them arrive on the battlefield and the incredible kind of morale boost that would be to common soldiers. And a lot of that comes through on, a, on that expressive artistic level. So from that point of view, Warhammer and Space Marines are, are very historically authentic. <laughs> There's no denying it. It's pretty cool. But I'd never want to go there. <laughs> I got to pull the rat, the rat men up on one thing here if you stop for a second. It may look cool and everything, but you don't need a giant pendant loincloth of mail hanging all the way down practically to the floor. There's, there's nothing there to protect. Yes, okay, put some mail over your genitalia. That's not a bad idea, but it doesn't need to be hanging down that far. That's wasteful and, and, and weight inefficient. So rat people, get with it. It's kind of interesting that they're wrestling with the problem of making a helmet for a, a rat person. What does a helmet for something like that look like? It's kind of a fun, a fun problem. <laughs> it's getting very surreal very fast. How's he getting so many shots out of single shot weapons? Oh, he's got lots of pistols. Fair enough. You gotta be really careful about, in practical terms, in real world terms, is covering your body in spikes. When you have spikes on your body, you are just as dangerous, if not more dangerous, to yourself and anybody immediately around you who has to work with that armor, who has to take it off, or put it on or whatever. I mean, in a fantasy realm, there might be a reason for doing it. Like the legend of the Lambton worm. It's a myth, it's a real medieval myth. Sir John Lambton is the local knight. It's his responsibility to deal with it. And he has to fight this worm. But the problem is that if you cut it, if you cut it up, it just grows back together and gets badder and scarier. So a witch tells Sir John that what he needs to do is cover his armor with spikes and blades. So the worm, like a python, wraps itself around him and his armor cuts it to pieces. The pieces fall in the fast flowing river and get taken away before they can grow back together. Fine, there's your rationale. That's when you need spikes on your armor. There's a good reason behind it, so fine. One thing you're seeing on this guy too that's a, that's a reoccurring problem you see that hanging down on either side of his, of his waist, he's got these spade-shaped plates. Uh, those are called tassets, and they're meant to protect the hips and the juncture between the top of the leg and the pelvis. Really, really important plates. And video games and television designers habitually show tassets on the sides of the leg. And those tassets need to be on the front. The front is where you get hit right? If you're a self-respecting warrior. Normally, warriors like this are concerned for their, their appearance. They don't really want to be going around covered in shit. But, you know, I can, I can let that go because I, I understand they've got, a, they've got a fantasy expressive thing going on here. Plate armor can protect you against a lot more than people think, but gunpowder weapons are, are still a Always a major problem, obviously. A narrow-bladed little thrusting sword like that might seem a bit like 
a weedy and, and wimpy for someone like that, but that's actually a much better sword to be using for a, a fully armored opponent. Because you can stab them in the gaps of between the armor rather than trying to get straight through it. The Emperor's will made manifest. We are the warriors of the Grey Knights. Oh well. Wow. There's certainly a, a knightly looking helmet in there somewhere. This is kind of neat because although these are like powered exoskeletons in the sci-fi universe, they're also making some very strong medieval references here. That's fine, that's fun. They're using heraldry, they've got little little shields on their left side, that's the right side to be wearing them. Vaguely knightly looking helmets combined with the technology. It's not as conceptually far-fetched as you might think either. That a knightly culture like this that celebrates the, the individual prowess of elite warriors that have their own kind of exclusive culture that's ruled by a set of ideals or, or moral precepts. It very much goes hand in hand with the technology. In the Middle Ages, the technology was the horse and the ability to fight on a horse at a high level and to have all this fantastic armor. And as we moved into the modern world, We've, we've, got, we've lost a lot of that cult of personality and individual hero prowess in modern militaries. That's not what modern militaries are about. Except in a vague whisper in like um, fighter pilots or something where there's almost a little bit of that dynamic still going on. There is the hint that in the next generation or two, we will start seeing hydraulically powered combat suits that then can reinvigorate potentially a knightly culture where you have these you know, technologically empowered specialist elite warriors. Once you've got the technology taking you there, the culture, nat the human culture naturally kind of gets embroidered around it. So this, this actually kind of strikes me as, as weirdly plausible. In a less literal way though, I really like how the, the Warhammer designers have really got their head around the incredible expressive power and potential that armor has. You know, these guys are perfectly aware that an armor is more than just fighting equipment, that it's turning the wearer into this extraordinary work of visual art. And it's broadcasting, it's radiating, all kinds of complex messages about the person inside, their loyalties, their beliefs, their, you know, everything about them is being constantly broadcast by their equipment. And you'd be, you know, a lot of people don't understand that. And it's nice to see that, that some people in the industry really do get that. Lots of skulls and spikes, yeah, this is uh... You've got to know he's evil. <laughs> it's kind of hard, kind of hard to miss, I guess. Most of his cool trophies would just get immediately wrecked in this kind of combat. I actually like the use of color here too. I mean, they do still look like individuals, even though they're all of the same color. And historically, armor was painted. There, not all knights were shining and mirror polished. A lot of lower status armor was pol was just painted. Paint is a cheap way of making lower quality armor look nicer than it actually is. So, you know, having, having red armor like this isn't necessarily a, in itself as fantastical as it might seem. The Zura monster face helmets with the big horns do start to feel a, bit, a little bit goofy though. Whatever you're wearing, you know, you do have to be able to take yourself seriously. <laughs> on the battlefield. Now here's an interesting use of spikes. I've been going on about how I don't like spikes a lot, but here the, the use of spikes is, is actually a historical reference. The, the single spike coming out the top of the helmet is a reference to the German imperial uh, military helmets of the late 19th and early 20th century, the so-called Pickelhaub. So that's like a cultural reference point. So you put a spike on a helmet like that, no matter what else you do, you're thinking these guys are Teutonic, Imperial, you know, probably not very nice characters, you know? They look kind of like they're suffering from some kind of armor plague. 
it seems like they're celebrating kind of degradation and decay. Yeah, you're exactly right. Oh, really? And they're actually the trench fighters of, of that faction. Oh, really? The World War One thing. Great. Well, there you go. There's good design then. If that's what it says, then that's what it is. 10 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> Fanatical zealots. Nice detail of the rosary hanging down. I think a rosary on the belt, kind of some kind of religious reference there. That's kind of neat. The helmets clearly derived, you know, sci-fi abstraction of a 15th century salad, again, with a, a tail and a visor. The fleur-de-lis that they're using here is a very generic, very typical heraldic device. It's most commonly associated with France because the, the coat of arms of the medieval kings of France was a blue shield with gold fleur-de-lis, heraldic lilies, basically, on it. The fleur-de-lis is by no means exclusively French. It appears on heraldry all over the place. The, the sisters or whoever they are, perfectly entitled to use it if they want. But something about the geometry and the form of it is just really classically medieval. It's one of these images that is almost now, for present purposes, almost too generically medieval. I mean, so much of what Warhammer is doing is, is very skillful integration of sci-fi and historical references. I think it works fine here. Women wearing armor, fighting in armor historically, was pretty unusual. It did happen. And, uh, and certainly the, the image of uh, a woman in armor does appear again and again historically in art. That's kind of a, quite a powerful archetype. And it, it certainly puts a di different spin on their existing kind of aesthetic. There's never any such thing as obviously female armor. Breastplates with allowance, volumetric allowance for the breasts is a fantasy. There's really no precedent for that historically at all. Someone like Joan of Arc in the 15th century in France was a woman who really did wear plate armor leading the French army against the English in the later part of the Hundred Years' War. The, the purchase documents for her armor that was made for her on the orders of the King of France exist. We know she had it. But as far as we can tell, the armor that a woman would wear was just an a armor of the appropriate size. Once it was all put together, you wouldn't be able to tell that it was a woman. I have several you know, women friends who, in the jousting community who are great jousters. When they're all put together in their armor, on their horse, their visors down, there's nothing that would tell you that they're women. And it's just purely the sport against other people who have the guts to go against you in the field. And the, the gender issues just kind of disappear. Um, here, they, here they obviously don't disappear and they don't want them to, but this is a, a place where Warhammer is really going almost pure fantasy. I'm not sure the armor that they're wearing is good enough protection for the danger of this environment. I think everybody would be horribly injured very quickly here. I guess that's the point. The pot, the cooking pot on the head is a nice little touch. Um, that's, that's something you actually see in real late medieval and Renaissance art when they're sort of Hieronymus Bosch and uh, Bruchel and other Netherlandish painters, when they want to come up with a ridiculous fantasy satire of the armored body, the cooking pot on the head is a thing. No, Spike cheerleaders now. Again, I'm, I'm sort of worried for her safety. It's sort of hard to criticize this because like the real armor that American footballers wear is, is totally insufficient. A little bit of armor can often be more dangerous than wearing no armor at all because it, it can give you a false sense of safety. Sometimes it's actually better not to wear any armor at all. But their armor for what they're doing seems in insufficient. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to comment below what other games you'd like to see on the show and be sure to subscribe for more content like this and beyond.